Thank you, Tim. Uh, I also want to um, uh, thank uh, the organizers of the Gold Lab for inviting me to speak this, this afternoon. And in particular, since I have learned that um, uh, Dr. Gold here isn't in favor of neuroimaging studies. And so I think it's particularly generous of you, Dr. Gold, to invite me on, on the program. And I accept this as a kind of a personal challenge. And by the end of my lecture, maybe I'll ask you if we don't change your mind just, just a little bit. Um, I'm going to start my talk um, with an extraordinarily bold assumption. And that bold assumption is that I think the most important problem in all of neuroscience today, see, I told you it was bold. I think the most important problem in, of, in all of neuroscience today is the problem of the, our understanding of the interface between mind and brain. So this problem is particularly interesting in terms of those of us who are academics and who like to understand basic brain function, but it becomes particularly poignant when we want to understand the neurophysiological nature of things like uh, autism, autism and other neurodegenerative disorders or other psychiatric diseases. So um, I'm going to start this section on the head um, with the head. And my entry is that the head is really the beginning of the source of the root to the brain because we get to the brain through the holes in our head. And let me give you an example. Um, I'll give you an example. There we go. The eyes, first hole in the brain, back to the visual system. Ears, second hole in the brain, to the auditory system, and nose and mouth, um, and so on. And so this is the point at which I warn you that I'm going to include in this talk, in fact, the next five slides are going to be introductory slides. This is going to be the Brain 101. These are the slides that I would give to my freshman class. And I don't want to insult any of you, but I want to be sure that we're kind of all on the same wavelength and we all have kind of the same vocabulary and that Dr. Gold has all the information he needs at the end of this talk in order to see if he has changed his mind at all about the value of, of neuroscience, I mean, not, the value of neuroimaging. Okay, so here we go. So the route to the brain um, through the holes in the head starts with the areas of the brain that are specifically specialized for vision, hearing, smelling, and we know that there are particular parts of your brain that do those tasks. But in addition to that, there are particular parts of our brain that do other very important tasks like manage our language system so that when we're speaking or listening, we're using parts of the brain in the back of the brain to understand what we're hearing or saying and also parts of the brain in the front that having to do with speech production. And then, of course, you all know that there are many, many other areas of the brain that do many, many other uh, specific things. In addition to the specific parts of the brain that are involved in specific functions, we know that every part of the brain is connected. And we have these techniques now to look at the connections between areas. But these connections between brain areas give us great insight into how they function. And so um, this, these two factoids, the fact that everything in the brain is connected to everything else and specific parts of the brain do specific things, lead us to kind of a very simplistic understanding of the principles by which the function of the brain is organized. And the first we like to call the real estate principle, just what I showed you. Specific parts of the brain have specific things. This is a widely appreciated principle by every person on the street, actually. Uh, the trafficking principle, the complex tasks, are accomplished by connections between specific parts of the brain. And the third principle, the principle of unity, the principle that simply says mind and brain are one thing that uh, mind emerges from the brain. And that leads me to my next slide, which is how in the world do we study the, the unity between mind and brain? We study it by first 
um, neuroimaging techniques that allow us to look at both the structure of the brain, which is done with classical MRI machines, and then we add to our ability to look at what the brain looks like by adding something to do with function. And so what we do is that we put people in scanners, these MRI scanners, and we ask them to do specific tasks. And what this represents here is a time series where there's a time where the person in the scanner is just resting. And then during an active epoch, we show them various pictures of things, in this case, um, and we ask them to silently to themselves name the pictures. And then they rest, and then they do it over and over again. Now, why would we ask them to do that? Well, one of the reasons is that we're interested in understanding the neural correlates of our language system. If I was wanting to know about the neural correlates of sensory and motor systems, I would have them do a different task. But in this particular task, we believe that asking people to do these naming of objects while they're in this MRI scanner, running in a particular sequence, giving us pictures both of the brain and of the active neural substrates, that we can learn something about, in this case, the language system. So I like to refer to this as a mindoscope, because this is a little bit like a telescope or a microscope that takes us into the mind. And it's the first time in the history of science that we've been able to answer questions that have been the purview of philosophers. Finally, finally, we can begin to objectively, in hardcore physiological terms, look at how the mind works. Now, I think that's pretty exciting. He's nodding his head, too. <laughs> so OK, we're doing good, right? <laughs> we're doing good. All right, so functional MRI is not the only technique that allows us this privileged view of the mind based on the physiological operations of the brain. There is a new technique on the horizon. Now, this is new um, because there's not very many uh, applications of it. But it is a technique called near-infrared spectroscopy. And it uh, works on a slightly different principle. But um, instead of putting people in a scanner, um, we can um, read signals from active neural tissue by, um, by um, looking at the uh, outputs of these optodes. And these, op these optodes are indicating um, um, locations of active neural tissue. So this technique uh, gives us freedom from having to put somebody in an MRI scanner. And I'm sure that many of you in the audience have been in MRI scanners before. It's been described a little bit like being put in a garbage can with somebody pounding on the side of it. It's a pretty hostile environment. It's scary. You can't move your head. Um, uh, and um, it's, uh, it's not a very pleasant situation. And so it's not an ideal situation for for looking at the neural substrates that underlie behavior, because you, the behaviors that can be elicited in that environment are very constrained. But if we had another technique that would allow people to be in more naturalistic, more, um, more comforting conditions, that um, it would be a, a very important um, add-on technology. So that's near-infrared spectroscopy. Um, now, this is my last. Um, Brain 101 slide, but it's a very important slide, and I want to warn you a little bit because there's a little bit of uh, tech, there's, there's, there's some numbers in this, and, and it might not be so easy to understand, but I want all of you in the audience to know that neuroimaging is not magic, that this is, this is hard stuff to do. These are real signals. There's real signal processing that goes in this, and there are principles of how we get these signals, and I want you to understand uh, that. It basically, whether it's near infrared spectroscopy or uh, whether it's functional MRI, the principle is exactly the same. And that is, in your brain, when the neural tissue is active, it is recruiting blood. That recruitment of blood is what we're actually measuring. We're not actually measuring the signals from the neurons. Although we imply that we're measuring signals from neurons, we are not. We are looking at a proxy of information of active neural tissues. And that proxy is based on the fact that 
of active neuro tissue is recruiting blood. That recruitment of blood um, is highly oxygenated, which is very convenient for, um, for us from the point of view of magnetic resonance imaging because oxygen in the blood changes the magnetic resonance signal. And as that change in the magnetic sig resonance signal in local areas of the brain that actually uh, give us our magnetic resonance signal. In the case of functional uh, near-infrared spectroscopy, it is the same principle. Active neural tissue is recruiting blood, but that oxygen changes the spectral absorption of the, um, of the blood. So what happens is that we shoot a little laser beam of light from those optodes, and we measure what comes out. And what comms out differs depending on whether it's gone through highly oxygenated or deoxygenated blood. Uh, just as the theory predicts that when done properly, the signals from either technique are exactly the same. So here uh, is an illustration of somebody um, uh, doing a finger thumb tapping task. And the activity is just where you expect in the um, um, motor and sensory strips. And this indicates that the signals are identical as they should be. OK, so now what has this got to do with autism? Well, autism is a uh, neural developmental disorder. Um, it is um, characterized by severe disabilities in language, um, communication, and social interaction, as this says. Um, it is surprising with autism being as common as it is. The prevalence, by the way, uh, depending on how you measure it, uh, but according to the recent CDC uh, figures, one out of 88 children born is somewhere on the autism spectrum. And whether it's one out of 88 or one out of 100 or even one out of 200, it is a lot. And so this is a very important um, neurodevelopmental disorder to understand. But the truth of the matter is that the neural mechanisms for this are unknown. Um, so um, we have applied um, functional neuroimaging, we and others, to begin to get some insight into the neural mechanisms that underlie autism. So let us start with the first major disability of autism, and that is um, the, the inability or the disability for language, or, um, not necessarily communication. I'll get to that in a minute, but, but language. And so to do that, let's look at a canonical language system, a language system that works in the brain for all of us as typical human beings. We've got the auditory hole in the head, and then we've got uh, the comprehension area. This, and, and the speech production area. For those of you who know neuroscience, this is Wernicke's area, named after Wernicke in the late 1800s, who, who discovered this area from patients with aphasia, and Broca's area, the area discovered by Broca, uh, similarly at the similar time frame uh, with patients who could understand language perfectly well, but could not speak. This, notice that these areas are connected with a northern root and a southern root. These have fancy names. This is the arcuate fasciculus and the uncinate. Um, but these are well-known pathways that um, describe a system for language in the human, in the human brain that um, is essential um, operating parts for um, the um, engagement of language. OK. So real data. Um, so we set about to just ask a very simple question. Um, how does the language system of children with autism differ from the language system of um, age-matched typical children? And so um, over here on this side, we've got some neuroimaging results. And if I, if I would have done this, spent a little bit more time on this, I would have just taken this these, these sagittal views and not showing you the, these axial flat views. And the reason is that the information is completely redundant. It's just that in neuroscience, we like to show things all possible ways. And so this is 
the flat view of the brain, and this is the side view of the brain. And I would have showed you, left done, done only this one, because I showed you the side view for the canonical view of the brain. So here, you can see we, what we did. First of all, let's tell you what we did. We put kids in the scanner. Now these over here, these typical normal kids, and they range from age from about 6 to 11, so they're kids. Now why in the world would they go in our scanners to do this task, and why in the world would their parents let them? Um, they go in the scanner because most of them want material for their science project, and what could be better than a picture of your brain for your science project? Even the little six-year-olds, they want science projects, and they want to show their brain. Okay, and most of their parents are like my colleagues. And this, at this point, I was at Columbia University. And so they're, they're faculty members. And so they want to get their kids involved in science. They want to look at their brains. They want to encourage them to do well in their science projects. And so it, everybody's happy. It's really a great thing. These kids love going in the scanner. In fact, sometimes it's hard to get them out. They, they're having such a good time in there. OK, and, and, and even better, um, as, and any of you guys know that if you've been in the scanner, that the, the person who puts you in tells you, no matter what you do, don't move your head. You have to stay absolutely still, okay? So now how do you get these kids to stay still in the scanner? Well, mostly we use techniques that all parents know about, like bribery. And so what we do is we say, okay, kid, if you hold still in the scanner and we get really good images, then it's McDonald's afterwards, or it's M&M's, or you know, whatever. But the kids have rewards generally set up. So what we do is that we have their parents recording for them before they go in their scanner, just narratives. Because it's all these kids have to do in the scanner is just listen to their parents. Now, sometimes this is a little bit difficult, but they do. They listen to their parents, and their, their parents have recorded things like, um, taught like as if they were talking to them in the scanner, and they're telling them to lie still, and they're telling them that, yes, we know it makes a lot of noise, but everything is fine. We're right here with you. And afterwards, we're going to McDonald's or, or whatever. So the kids love listening to this, and they hold really still. And we can get really beautiful pictures of this is the auditory system, Wernicke's area, Broca's area, everything's working perfectly, and the kids do really well in their science, in their science fairs. Now, we have these autism children that go in the scanner. And this is really sad because these children were severely affected in, in this particular study. And regardless of their age, from like five to eleven. The, the largest vocabulary that any of them had was about five words. And so they couldn't really, really understand what we were saying. But nonetheless, uh, we played for them videos mostly of Elmo. Elmo is a very popular video. And watching Elmo, they held their heads really still, and they sort of listened to their parents. But OK, the point of this slide is that I want you to see that the back of the brain seems to be working reasonably well but the front of the brain is not. Information does not seem to be getting up there, and that seems to be consistent with the notion that these children have very um, seriously impaired language functions. But, oh, sorry, let's go back, okay. All right, so, so that's consistent with uh, what a lot of people have thought about autism, that uh, it's really, um, uh, the language difficulty is represented by a disconnection uh, hypothesis where information from the back of the brain, the auditory system, Wernicke's area, and so on, just doesn't get up front. So they call it a disconnection hypothesis, suggesting that the um, a problem is in the neural circuitry that transmits information from the back to the front. But then, have, you guys are scientists. Have you ever done one too many experiments? <laughs> this, is, this is an example of the one too many experiment. So, and I did this because one of my graduate students um, noted that many of the children in our study, and it's known in autistic um, cases generally, that um, are very, they're very talented musically often, are very focused on music, and have very uh, strong musical affinities. And so my graduate student said, well, let's just try it Instead of listening to their parents, let's just try it with song or music. And so we ran the same study again uh, with having the children listen to their favorite songs in the scanner. Uh, 
Um, notice over here the controls, the, although they're perfectly normal, um, on these particular slices of the brain, the controls did not show the left side language capability. And that you sort of expect, it's more over here on the right side, but look at this. These are our autism kids, and this is the front of the brain. And it is completely active. So what we managed to do with the song stimulation is activate a whole language system. Now, this was really paradoxical and unexpected because what it said to us is, and it was very hopeful, that these kids didn't have broken language systems at all. The systems were there and they were perfectly intact and they did actually work sometimes, but you had to stimulate them with song. And so this sort of took us back to square one, like what is really, really going on here? Uh, certainly the disconnection hypothesis was far too simplistic. But so we, before we left it, the topic, we did a, a direct test of the dis disconnection hypothesis. And we went back to the capability that we have of looking at uh, all possible connections in the brain. We do a sequence called DTI, or diffusion tensor imaging, which allows us to look at the white matter tracks in the brain. And we can do this easily with tractography methods where we simply set a seed in the back of the brain and we say, okay, computer, give me all of the pathways that go from here to here. And so we did this with the normals, and these are, this is the end result. The, uh, the blue are the, is the, the southern pathway, the uh, green is the overlap, and the red is the, um, is the northern pathway. And you can see this pattern of terminations of, ter of pathways from uh, Wernicke's area. And you notice over here with the autistic group that uh, it is identical. There's absolutely no way to see any difference at all between the two. And so um, uh, just exactly what our statistical inferences suggested uh, based on the behavioral studies, the actual physiological evidence of the structure was consistent with that. There simply is no difference uh, between the uh, construction of the autistic uh, language system and that of, of more typical individuals. So that sent us back to square one. And so we went back and asked, well, okay, what is it about autism that uh, might represent a, a difference? Um, uh, if, it, if the language system is there, it just doesn't work very well, um, how else can, can we, we look at this? Um, and so uh, this is just an example of the um, eligibility criteria for autism in our particular study. Um, um, the cutoff for diagnosis on these scales, these are, are subjective interview scales, which by the way is the standard of care for diagnosis of autism, and it usually isn't done until kids are like four or five years old. But the cutoff for these criteria are very low, and you can see our children uh, in our study uh, were very far outside the bounds of the uh, typical numbers uh, that you would see. This is our particular study, but in general, the, uh, oops, oh. hmm, interesting. Um, let's see, Google software update. Do we have time for a Google software update? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, here we come. <laughs> House rule is you never let a computer know you're in a hurry. I mean, go get a different computer. Oh dear. Okay, you guys. This wouldn't be the first talk I've given without slides. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to continue. He'll get the slides in a minute. Okay. So, so, um, one of the things that is, in fact, 
this is sort of a departure point anyway, because um, this is a point where I think that as scientists, we're all innovators. And sometimes there aren't, we doesn't, the, our subject matter doesn't come with answer books. And so this is a part where sort of my work, at least in this line, is departed from a conventional, conventional pathway. And I just want to explain this to you. So we went back and we looked at uh, some of the uh, characteristics of autism. The most important one is not really the language deficit. That's the one that we can measure. But the most important one, the one that is the most severe and, and oftentimes diagnosed the earliest, is the fact that the child doesn't communicate. It's not that he can't speak. He doesn't communicate in a way with, with uh, others. He's not interested in communication. It's a socialization problem. And so we said, all right, why don't we develop a way to study that? It's time out. Uh, let's just go down. I can't go up. Um, let's start right, Sorry, on the referee, right there. I'm going to add five more. Okay. Oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> we'll, we'll be okay. Thank you very much. He's doing, he's doing a great job of fixing this. I would have fallen apart. If this was in my hands, I would have fallen apart before now. Okay. So this is good. Thank you. There's a hand of applause for that one. That was good. Oh, my God. Go away. Wait a minute. Don't go away. Oh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Seriously, usually, a, usually a, a space bar will do it. Just stay right here. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so what what I what I discovered was that, in fact, in fact, if there's one more sidebar here, and then I'll go on. Um, I spent an awful lot of my time as a scientist, incredulous that I had to answer a problem that I thought should have been answered 20 years ago. You know, like, why in the world? What have these been people doing all this time when there was this important question that wasn't answered? And why did I have to answer that question? Well, OK, so this is the context for this. So you would think that by now, with all of the studies in neuroscience, that we would know something about our brains in communication our brains when we are talking to somebody else. What is the neural circuitry that underlies my ability to talk and listen, talk and listen, and exchange in a communication um, event with another person? This is one of the most fundamental functions of all human beings, and we start communicating with each other from nearly the day that we are born. And yet, truth is, we know almost nothing about the neural circuitry that underlies our ability to communicate back and forth. Well, I was a bit incredulous. I said, OK, uh, we need to understand this. From the, in order to understand what's really wrong in autism, we need to understand this first in human beings. So this was uh, in, first in typical human beings. And so this is sort of how I set up uh, the model to think about, OK, we're going to go from one brain to two brains. Now, one of the reasons why we know very little about this is because we have all studied the mind-brain problem, for the most part, in MRI scanners. We put single brains in the scanner. We study single brains at a time. And when we mush them all together as a group and search for the principles of neuroorganization, and we've been pretty successful at doing that. But when we want to study two people at a time, we don't have a technology to do that. And so uh, the, our technology has really constrained our ability to look at this question of how, what goes on when two people are communicating. And indeed, would that be altered in the case of aut autism? Now, this is the fun part of science. Because when, when you discover that you're onto something that nobody else has ever been onto before, you don't have the burden of other people's papers or ideas. You know, you can kind of just sit down in the back of a, of a cafe somewhere and start writing on a napkin. And people start believing you because you just kind of made it up. And this is where we are here. So we sort of made this up. If, if we were going to have a model of how two brains communicate, what in the world would it look like? Well, the first thing that would happen, something would start. And actually, I was reminded of the starter part of this model from the last etude 
that we had right before this session. That was such a beautiful illustration of people starting to communicate. And I wondered if I wasn't the only one in the audience who looked at that and said, gee whiz, what's going on in their brains? What in the world is starting that connection between the two of them? OK. So there's a plug for your etudes. Remember that when you evaluate the neuroscience. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next, <laughs> the next thing, the next thing is we, we'd have to have the brains connected in some way, probably with an attention module, and then we would need a regulator. We would need something um, uh, that would tell us when to listen, when to talk, when to listen, when to talk, and we have control mechanisms in the brain that we think would probably probably work. And so from a, yeah. I just made that up. Yeah, that's true. Scientists do that a lot. Yeah, I, I confess, I just made that up. <laughs> All right. So then, but the value of making stuff like that up is then we can start to make hypotheses and start thinking about how we would, how we would test these things. So, so the first hypothesis here is that dialogue, would act, dialogue as opposed to monologue, would increase activity and attention or integrative areas of the brain. Uh, it's a, kind of a crude hypothesis, but it gets us going. Hypothesis two, that we could have, we, that dialogue as opposed to monologue would increase activity in control areas of the brain, and we know a little bit about that from my little lecture 101, uh, uh, control areas of the brain. And then the third one is that there would be evidence for coherence across brains, that there's something in the connectivity between two brains that would be manifested in some kind of neurophysiological substrate. And so this, this Making up of the little box model and the hypothesis is sort of what I had to start with. So um, a, basic, um, a basic paradigm, you know, we don't study mind and brain without uh, the, the behavior, the paradigm. And so we have a couple subjects. We always now think of subjects in terms of subject pairs. And we have these monologue conditions where they sit, they just name objects by themselves, and then they listen to somebody else naming objects, and then they name more objects. But they're, they're naming and listening, naming and listening, naming and listening, and they're doing this completely under monologue conditions. So there's no interaction between them at all. Then, of course, we have our dialogue condition. And you can see where we're going with this. We're going to compare the data, monologue, dialogue, and see if we're going to test these hypotheses, see if there's any merit to this little thing that I made up. And so, so uh, we, have, we can have the same kind of condition where people, the talker names the objects, the listener listens, but then he responds to the naming of the objects, and then he names his own, and that person listens. And so we can do the naming of the objects, same task, but with an interactive component. And this is kind of the way we, in, in my side of neuroscience, do things. We like to have behavioral tests that are as much like as like alike as possible, but only differ in the condition that we're interested in. And this, we're interested in the difference between dialogue and monologue. OK. So now, what I'm going to show you, the next few slides, are data slides. And I, they are only pilot data. This is not finished research. You have to invite me back next year for a, a finished story. We uh, do not have our own equipment. I, I just have been recruited to Yale. I just started a new laboratory. And I didn't know very much about near-infrared spectroscopy. And we didn't even have this equipment. We went around the university. Thank heavens. Yale is a wonderful place, and, and that um, people are very collaborative. And so I just went around borrowing equipment. And I made some friends. I made some enemies. But we started uh, doing these experiments and equipment and laboratories that weren't our own just to see if it was going to work. And so what I'm going to share with you is some data that tells me that we've got a tiger by the tail here, that we've got some really interesting things ahead of us. And I, I hope you're a little disappointed when I'm done with this talk that I haven't answered all the questions that I've, that I've raised. But um, I hope I will inspire you that there's a real future direction here in looking at uh, the interaction part of the brain in this way, and that it probably will have some hope for, for autism as well. OK, so this is, uh, these are two people in my lab. This is Yoda, and this is Junior Jedi. And, and, and they really are in my lab. And, <laughs> 
<laughs> They're talking to each other wearing these hairnets from ear, ear, near infrared spectroscopy. And this is a, um, uh, be sort of a, a fancy analysis, a principal components analysis. But what, what we do is we, we mush it all together and we pull out components of waveforms that correspond to specific parts of, of the experimental paradigm. The dialogue is the only one that is not, these, uh, the dialogue is the one we're interested in. All of these are monologue conditions. And you can see that the interesting component here is in the dialogue component and that the neural substrate associated with that is diffuse, uh, widely spread, and pretty much as expected. This to me is the most hopeful data that I've seen in a long time. It says that when we develop techniques with the granularity to parse this out, that we're going to see some beautiful effects of the, inter, of, the, of the neural circuitry that underlies the difference between monologue and dialogue. Uh, we need a, a lot more work on this, but this is, this is pretty important. So this is hypothesis one. Our neural system specialized for dialogue, particularly related to attention. I think that this is strong evidence that they are. Um, the next um, hypothesis that we uh, formed was our specific areas associated for dialogue. And uh, are they related to these cognitive control, talking and listening? And so here, I'm showing you waveforms that are from, we've taken um, uh, optodes here from, in this particular case, from Broca's area, uh, the inferior frontal gyrus on the left side. And we're just reading from that one place in the brain because that's all I had the technology to do at the time. And you can see that so subject one is talking, subject two is listening, and then they switch in the monologue condition, but in the dialogue condition, you look at the difference in the waveforms, how much more excited that area is under dialogue than monologue conditions. Um, the uh, group data are consistent um, with a, a positive response to dialogue. Um, and similarly here, if I take out the periodicity that I'm creating because of the experimental paradigm, that is the talking and listening epic, if I take all of that out, I say, is there any reason to believe that there's any additional coherence between the two brains? That is, is there, a, is there a network between these two brains? Is it on? And we look at that in the co-variation with these, um, the activity of these areas with the extraction of the principal component that we've added. Um, and you can see that in the, this is my fault, um, that in the, um, uh, monologue condition, the correlation is really very small relative to the dialogue. And here in picture form across the waveform of the experimental series, you can see that uh, indeed there's a, a, an amazing connection uh, between these two brains represented in the uh, neural circuitry. Okay, so just a brief summary of these, these pilot data. What have we showed uh, with respect to um, hypothesis one? Uh, the preliminary summary is yes, we have evidence that there's a, a tension and readiness systems that are well programmed for dialogue. The case of hypothesis two, the, the, that the dialogue increases the cognitive control areas, absolutely. Um, it certainly looks produ productive, as well as in case of hypothesis three, the preliminary experiments uh, suggest that we've got evidence for coherence across these uh, across these brains. Okay, so this is a summary because we haven't, two minutes? Yep. Oh, good. it's perfect timing. I got, I got two minutes more to say. Um, okay, two minutes. Uh, per, um, so so um, um, we've got a, a whole new area uh, to study uh, mind and brain, and that is in terms of we go from single brains to, to double brains here. And I want to point out that this is a really, uh, really interesting uh, example of translational science. Oftentimes in translational uh, work, we think that the, the, the benefits go from bench, that is from the lab, to bed, to the, to the clinical service. But this is a, a, a nice example, I think, where the communication goes both ways. And in this particular example, we're going to study these problems now that we we encountered, because of our work with autism, 
We're going to study them in the uh, typical brain to understand the first principles, and then we're going to go back to the autistic brain with the same question and see if we can uh, answer that, that this question in a little bit more meaningful way of how is it that this autistic brain and its function differs from the typical brain. So most of this talk was about the and beyond, not so much of the neuro neural correlates that, that characterize autism or even the typical brain. But we're, we're left with the simple situation that uh, um, interpersonal communication, that fundamental uh, function that all of us are born with and carry with us through our whole lives, um, are not well understood in terms of neural models and that is certainly not understood in artistic individuals where it's probably one of the most critical functions for us to understand. Um, and perhaps even prevent, or even use for early diagnosis, and if we could do that, we could start doing something about it sooner. Um, so what's our plan for action? This is my last point. There's always a plan for action. First, we're gonna develop this new brain paradigm on some new tech. Uh, new technology, the near infrared spectroscopy that we now have, are going to be having in our lab soon, designed for this type of work. Um, we're going to determine the neural dynamics that are engaged during this interpersonal interaction, and then we're going to take this back to the autism model. Thank you. Thank you. So we have some questions I can see. There. This, this guy here. Oh, no, 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 not that guy there. He's, <laughs> he's asked far too many questions. We can wait for that oh, shoot. lady there. We'll, we'll get, okay, we'll get to right, you, Larry. Right. I'm going to do the rude thing of mentioning two things, but hopefully they're both brief. And one is that I was recently at a um, conference by Dan Siegel. And his definition, which I'm sure you know of the, of the mind, is that it's not isolated to the brain, but to the sensations arising from the body and the interactions um, with in information and animate material in the outside world, et cetera. And it seems to me like this experiment that you just did about the, the synchronicity being generated in dialogue between two people is really does support, in my mind, his definition of the mind being broader and very much involving the integration. And that's, that's my comment, but my question is, um, when you look at your autistic brain and you have all the activity in the Wernicke's area and you're showing adequate connectivity, which had been the hypothesis, what jumps into my mind is the old-fashioned woo-woo thing about automatic handwriting and all that stuff that autistic children were comprehending but couldn't communicate. And does your data suggest something like that with activity in Wernicke's and connectivity? Um, okay, that's a really, really good question. The question is for, for let me just paraphrase this a little bit. Uh, the question is, um, since we saw activity in Wernicke's area with the autistic children, did that mean that they were comprehending what we were saying, but the disconnection to the front of the brain suggested that they just couldn't speak? Um, of course, we didn't test that specifically, but I can tell you, I mean, because we, you, you, it's, the, you run into the problem, we can't interpret what's, what, a, what a person is sensing or feeling or thinking from the neural circuitry. So there's a disconnect there in the inferences that we can make. What we discovered in other papers on this, in other studies that we did, that were also published on this study, is that if you actually looked at the activity um, unit by unit in Wernicke's area and you compared it with the song and with the language, the language activity was very depressed, which also meant that probably there was some disruption in how the speech was interpreted. Does that mean that they didn't understand? No. But it's, it's consistent with the idea that they might be more difficulty in comprehension. But that's all we can say about that from the data that we have. That's, what the, that's consistent with the clinical picture as well, yeah. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what's going on with song that's not happening with speech. But before you do that, I just want to tell you one little anecdote. I had a 
colleague with a very, very serious stuttering problem, but it didn't happen when he sang, only when he spoke. And I wonder if that's related in any way to what you were talking about. Okay. Um, well, that, that incident reminds me, of course, of um, Oliver Sacks' uh, book, uh, the, his uh, point that he's made so popular that when you use song in many conditions of aphasia or stuttering or uh, conditions of communication difficulties, even motor difficulties, that patients that can't perform do perform. Uh, they can talk, they can sing uh, when they can't engage in a normal con uh, conversation. Um, um, what was the, the oh, what, what's the mechanism? Well, you know, I can only shoot from the hip. Um, uh, the, the whole point from this is that, that song is very different from language. It has privileged access, it appears, to other parts of the brain that the language does not. It is thought that it kind of goes through these emotional systems, the amygdala, maybe, uh, or stuff like that, maybe. Uh, we don't know. The truth is we don't know. There's an awful lot to learn. And I think if, if there's only one take-home message you guys take from this is that there is so much more to learn. There's so much that we need to know. But that's a very good question. I think Larry wants to make a comment about neuroimaging. No, 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 quite the opposite. I, I'm sort of 90% of the way there, but I really, I really was before your talk, to be honest. But so I have three things that I'm confused by, and if you answer this, then I'll be completely there. I'll understand it. Um, I think. Uh -oh. No, no. Well, so, so, so a long time ago, somewhere I learned that your brain does, you know, kind of 60% of the oxygen or some number for your body, lots. Um, and so I thought you had a when I thought about this, that you had a signal-to-noise problem, and which I don't understand. I, I understand signal-to-noise, but not here. How would nerve activity use enough oxygen to be uh, enough, you know, hemoglobin in an oxygenated state to be, which I think of as not a very intense piece of work, nerve activity, because I don't know that it is. So in my mind, you'll have little blips that you can't see, and then when you show these pictures where everything is gray, except where it's bright orange and bright red, implying that the signal to noise is gigantic, there's, some, there's something going on here where there's a cutoff and you know what you can measure, and it must be just a blip that turns into bright red. Is that true? Uh for, yeah, first of all, um, Larry raises an extremely important question, and that is about the signal and how we report it. Um, the, the signal to noise issue is a very important one. The brain is always active all the time. And whether that's noise or not, we don't know. It's just always doing stuff. And when a region or, or a small part of the brain, in fact, well, let me just clarify this. Um, when in functional MRI, we are working with units of the brain we call voxels, a volume element. A volume element is about the size of a grain of rice. It includes many, many, many thousands of neurons. And so within a single voxel, stuff's going on all the time. But if it is activated, it starts recruiting blood. It comes to this microvasculature, which has a radius of about three millimeters around it, and that changes the magnetic susceptibility. And what Larry's question gets at is when and where do you take that signal that is changed and call it a threshold above which you color it some color and below which you ignore it? And that, that we don't have to do that. We do that for summary clarity, but, but under the hood, there's this whole signal that it's rising in about four, it takes about four seconds for it to reach its, its peak, and it's doing all of this stuff. It's slow and kludgy. It's doing all of that stuff, and exactly where in that rise the sensations come and go and vary, it is not known. And in fact, another reason, here I can make Larry's point for him, why, why neuroimaging needs to be kind of looked at askance until we understand it better, is that we really don't understand that mechanism by which the blood is recruited by these active neural tissues. So we, there's an awful lot in that transition 
from the resting noisy neuron to where we see these red blobs in our heat maps that we don't understand. Was, did, that, did that kind of address your question? Did I get it? Thank you. I think we scored a goal in extra time, so we should probably move on. Thank you. We'll, we'll carry on afterwards. Thank you.